are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first D&D Next Hangout and Live Broadcast. I'm Trevor Kidd, Community Manager for D&D, and with me are Mike Merles and Jeremy Crawford of the D&D R&D team. Hey, everybody. Hi, everyone. Uh, today we'll be talking about the feedback we're seeing from all you playtesters on the current D&D &D, D &D playtest packet, as well as what we can expect to see in the future. Uh, let's get to some introductions uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the D&D Next team. Mike, why don't you start us off? Sure. Uh, my name is Mike Merles. I am the uh, senior manager for the D&D R&D team. And uh, so that basically means I uh, coordinate everything D&D from the, the tabletop role-playing game to any video games we're doing, to the novels and board games. And within the D&D uh, Next project, uh, I'm kind of like the guy who serves almost as like the, the voice of the customer, uh, the voice of the gamer. Uh, I'm not doing a lot of the actual design work, but I am reviewing the, the, the work. Uh, I do a lot of work processing the uh, playtest feedback and applying that to, to the design in terms of figuring out, okay, the playtest feedback is saying X and Y, so we need to do A and B to correct for that. And I'm Jeremy Crawford. I oversee the development and editing of all products for Dungeons & Dragons. So that means I oversee basically the final form of whatever it is we publish. Uh, and that, that means the, the game mechanics need to work, the words need to be beautiful, uh, and everything needs to fit together uh, as well as it can. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, so let's start off with something we've seen a lot of positive feedback on, uh, the fighter. A lot of people love the way the fighters turned out, mostly because of the uh, expertise dice and the maneuvers. Um, some people want to see more options for the fighters. Some people want to see something a little bit more streamlined. Um, what kind of things are you guys doing to offer these kind of streamlined or more complex fighters for the future? So um, one of the nice things about having the maneuvers that interact with uh, the expertise dice is it's not hard at all for us to just express different maneuvers that are either easier to use or that don't compete with each other in terms of options. So for instance, you can imagine right now the fighter can use expertise dice to gain a bonus to damage. So you could also imagine other maneuvers that come in that do things like give you a bonus on a strength check, um, that give you a bonus, let's say, in certain uh, to intimidate somebody or things like that. So to keep things fairly straightforward, we can just define uses of the expertise dice through maneuvers that we give to you maybe like as a, as a default setting for the fighter, like one of the most classically fighter things. And so you, you're you really avoiding a lot of complexity because if you're playing that fighter, you're never trying to think, how do I want to spend my expertise dice or do I want to save them up for this or use them for that? You're just using them to yeah, as a bonus to damage. Uh, now the default we have right now is you can use them as a bonus to damage or you can use them to reduce damage you have against you. And I actually like that in terms of complexity because I think it makes it pretty easy for the fighter to think, do I want to go more offense or go more defense? It's a pretty straightforward choice point. So even at the, the, the simplest level, there's still a choice there for the player where you can react to, to what's going on you know, in, 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 in the adventure. The, um, but of course, like, like everything else, we'll be looking at feedback and see how people feel about it. So far, uh, people seem to, to like that level of complexity. Um, but the... Um, you know, we could also, we had talked about at some point, like, would we do things like in place of maneuvers just giving you um, just a, a flat bonus to things? Um, I don't know if we'd want to go down that road, because I think it kind of distorts a little bit what maneuvers stand for, like how they fit into the rest of the system. But um, but th that but at this stage, there isn't anything that's off the table. You know, it really just, just matters how we're seeing it play out and making sure that what players are looking for that they're finding in the game. Yeah, and as I mentioned in the, the podcast that went live today, we're, we're also experimenting with uh, how complex uh, we want to make the game. And so we, we right now are sort of pushing to the limit of complexity and in many ways are really testing the advanced version of the game. Uh, but every time uh, we put something into the play test that's really targeted at, targeted at our advanced players, uh, we always have plans for how we might then reframe that uh, in a more basic experience. Because we know for classes, particularly like the fighter, uh, that we, we often have a, a divided group of fans. Uh, we have one group of fans that wants the fighter with all the bells and whistles, tons of tactical options, you know, the, the master of the battlefield. Uh, but then we also have players who really just want to slay things and do so simply. Uh, and so we we continue to, to walk the tightrope and see how we can please both ends of not only the fighter spectrum, but of the, the spectrum of fans for every class. 
and and where the sort of sweet spot is for each class is different uh, because different classes uh, naturally appeal to different tastes. Um, well, that segues into the next. I step. have to put my uh, Uhura microphone back in so I can hear <laughs> what you're saying. Yes. All right, fun, fun Captain, setup. we're receiving transmissions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a nice segue into the rogue stuff because the rogue got its combat maneuvers this last packet as well, and it seems like we're trying to find a balance for where we want the rogue to stand. Um, a lot of people like the fact that the rogue has uh, expertise dice maneuvers, but we're seeing some criticism of the rogue is now a weaker version of the fighter, kind of yeah. with watered down uh, maneuvers and a weak sneak attack. Uh, was the rogue changed because it was overachieving in combat, or is this just a side effect of switching the class to the viewers in combat equity system? I think it's really just a matter uh, when, when we moved it over to the, uh, the maneuver system. Uh, do people expect that a rogue should be just as good as a fighter in, in, in combat, like in terms of how much damage you could do? Or do people expect that the rogue can be as good as the fighter if this, the situation is, is lined up correctly? Yeah, um, and, and just real quick to interject. Uh, it is important for people to know we did not set out to nerf the rogue. Uh, what, what people are seeing uh, is primarily our effort to integrate the rogue into the expertise and maneuver system. And, and as, Mike, as Mike was saying, uh, we want to see what feels natural for the rogue. Um, and yeah, this, this was not, this was not we're, we're out to get the rogue and we want to specifically make the rogue less powerful. Um, we're, we're basically testing the threshold. Um, yeah, just trying to see where, where people who play D&D think, well, where should these classes fit in, in relation to each other? The, um, and and we, have, we don't have the, sur the survey results yet, but um, just looking at feedback, I mean, I think it, it, I would not be surprised if we ended up just implementing s something along the lines of saying, uh, your ex expertise dice, you can always be spent for damage. That's just a default element of them that reflect your combat skill. Um, and then we give you different ways to spend them based on your class. So the rogues, uh, if the rogue can use sneak attack, it might be that you get more damage from those dice. But the fighter then now getting, it goes back to maybe having to give the fighter something new to make him different. And that might be something like, like right now the fighter has the parry where you can roll the dice to reduce damage. Maybe we make that more uh, I don't want to say complex, it's not quite the right word, but we make that more of a feature of the fighter. Because when you think right. of the fighter, you know, the core four, the fighter is the toughest character, he has the best AC, he's the hardest to kill, uh, you know, the fighter should be up at the front of the party, it's kind of a default thing. So maybe that's something where we really make those classes feel very different, like a baseline, they can do about this, the same amount of damage, but the, the, the rogue maybe can do more damage in the right situation, and the fighter is better at absorbing damage, things like that. Oh, sounds great. I mean, I know a lot of people like the rogue expertise dice, but I think they're waiting to see how it, you know, pans out long term. So, um, we also have another really big popular discussion on dead levels. Uh, for a quick explanation for those people new to the topic, dead levels are levels where you might gain an incremental increase to an attack, skill, uh, hit points, or some other attribute, but you don't gain any class abilities or features. Um, with that explanation out of the way, uh, how are you guys approaching dead levels in the D&D Next class design? You know, there's always a tension between um, wanting to make sure when you level up you get something and then also wanting to make sure the game doesn't get too complex. But uh, I think right now, uh, and I, uh, Jeremy could maybe disagree or disagree, at this stage of the design, we're not really worrying about, hey, let's make sure there's something at every level. We're just more looking at, let's make sure everything's working. Um, because we know as we learn more about the classes and as we get closer to, to finishing them, um, that's where you start seeing the important points where you can make them different. So, for instance, right. with the fighter thing with, like, the... Uh, this idea of the fighter getting the parry thing, making it like maybe a fighter only thing, that might just be a completely separate class feature that rests outside of maneuvers. So you can always use your, your, your expertise dice to do extra damage or do a special attack. Then you just have a separate fighter only ability that is like an off turn expertise die that you could use to reduce damage or do a counter attack and things like that. So like when you kind of think of it like, hey, if a fighter was to do a, go into a one-on-one -on -one duel with a rogue or a paladin or a monk, the fighter probably ha has, a really, has a really important edge because of his ability to, to parry in this sort of off-turn thing. The, um, then you'd say maybe the monk, well, the monk has key, and it can channel key to a, to a stunning fist, or can heal himself, or things like that. The paladin can smite, can use divine spells, can lay on hands. So you get the sense of, okay, these guys are all warrior types. They're all, when it just comes to the basic mechanics of swinging a sword or, or, or firing a bow, they're all pretty equivalent. It's this other thing that makes them unique, that makes a paladin different from a monk, different from a, different from a fighter. And, and this kind of goes back to the rogue, because you think, well, where does the rogue sit within the spectrum? Should he be better or worse? And it may turn out that the, um, if you just to measure how much damage everyone was doing, the rogue is actually 
equal to or better than these other classes, but he has far fewer hit points, worse AC because he's only in leather. Uh, he doesn't really have like a parry type mechanic or anything like that. He's more stealthy. The rogue's really good at delivering damage when he does want to attack, uh, then, uh, as opposed to being more defensive. And then also within the expertise system, which I like about it, we can then give you abilities where we can express your expertise not as damage, but as tricks, as kind of like you know what you think of in mechanical terms as control effects, where maybe the rogue's really good at out outwitting people, uh, mm -hmm. luring them into traps, um, things like that. So you might be playing a rogue and you're actually not doing a, a lot of damage, um, but in terms of the system, the way it's looking at it is you are doing a lot of damage because you're you're knocking guys over, you're misleading them, you're luring them into traps, things right. like that. Right. And and dead levels are certainly something that. We're mindful of that we discuss anytime we look at a new class, but in many ways, addressing that aspect of a class's design is a piece of refinement. Yeah, uh, it, it's something that is uh, a late stage task for us, and especially as we're experimenting with classes, a number of them will indeed, as people have seen in the playtest, uh, go out to the public with what are perceived as dead levels. Um, so, so A, it's important for people to know we're, we're aware of the issue, it's something we always discuss when we look at a class, but at the same time, uh, we want to avoid being dogmatic about it. Uh, like, we don't have a policy that states every level must deliver a, an actual new class feature. Uh, what's a far more important goal for us is that the leveling up experience for a particular class be satisfying and that a person always feel like they're getting more powerful in a way that feels appropriate for that class. Yeah. And so what that means is different classes are going to address sort of the dead level concept in a different way. Uh, a wizard or a cleric might simply address it through they're getting more spells. And, and really, from that perspective, the wizard and the cleric right now have no dead levels, uh, simply because they're getting more spell slots as they level up. Now, we might discover in playtesting that for many people, that's not enough. Well, I, th I think we've since, I haven't seen too many comments with the spellcasters having, right. having dead levels. Yeah, and so I, I think, fighter. yeah, it's, it's typically the non-spellcasters where this becomes an issue. Um, but again, we want, we want to test to see what feels right, uh, and, and again, not be dogmatic about it. Uh, and make sure that 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 leveling up experience is satisfying in a way that feels right for each class, rather than sort of having a one size fits all approach where you know we start shotgunning class features everywhere just to fill in holes on an on an advancement table. Yeah, the real question comes in like once you get above tenth level, uh, we don't want to be in a position where we're just giving you more stuff for the sake of giving you more stuff, mm -hmm. and that's where I think the uh, actually that's what I think the real test is because honestly, from levels one to ten you'll be getting something new at every level, whether it's a right. spell or a class feature or a class feature getting better. I'm not worried about that. Uh, it's just when you start talking about level, up to level 20, and then you start saying, well, you need 20 unique different things. Um, yeah, how is that going to work with it? But that's also an area where, you know, in, in the Legends and Lore, I think it was just this last one I wrote or had posted, um, that might be something where we say, okay, maybe above level 11 there are some, some dead levels, but we also have with the, the legacy system, which kind of represents stuff beyond your character class, like your high-level characters and influence in the world. That might be a rules module, an optional system you can insert that then starts filling up those dead levels, or at least gives you the opportunity, opportunity to fill those up with, with other things. So if you want something a little more complex, as opposed to just, well, you just you like dungeon crawling, that's really what you want to do for, for 20 levels, and you're just, you know, the game start. You don't want the game to change. It just might be for complexity's sake. We don't want to keep layering in more things. Right. And and one thing that we have uh, come back to many times in our discussions about high level play is this idea of higher level characters uh, gaining the option of uh, swapping out lower level options for new options. So they're getting something new, but not something new that's just simply being added on to yeah. what they had before. You could improve uh, it. Because yeah. Yeah. what we have found throughout the course of the game is if you simply add, 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 add as you go higher and higher up the level chain, you reach a point where you know it gets to your turn in a battle, for instance, and it's like you have 35 different options to choose from, and and the game just screeches to a halt. Yeah. You know, every time it comes to you know Mike's turn and then my turn, as we analyze all of the options before us and make our choice. Yeah. Or, or even worse, right? You have a scene where you come to 
some obstacle or puzzle and the party you spend like 20 minutes figuring out how to get through it and either get frustrated or find some complex way to get around it and then you realize oh I forgot I had a rope of climbing right it just was on the bottom of my character sheet I didn't see it or oh, I had a bonus in that you know when, when I'm trying to intimidate people or you know to when I'm negotiating I, I totally forgot about it and that would, that would have made a big difference the, um, so it kind of gets on both ends. Either you have so many options that you have trouble making a choice, or you have, you have so many options you start forgetting about them. Right. But the flip side is we do want people to have a, a healthy array of options throughout their character's career so that they feel yeah. that their character is advancing, that they have meaningful choices to make, uh, and that, that there's always something exciting waiting for them uh, as they adventure. Good deal. Oh, um, I need to put in my Uhura earpiece. <laughs> I'll wait. I'll wait. All right. I'm ready. I'm ready to hail the ship. All right. <laughs> We're going to make lots of Star Trek references today, I think. Um, so another popular topic out there is uh, you guys touched on a little bit some of the changes to the spellcasting system that you guys have done with uh, Wizard Traditions and uh, Cleric Domain, stuff like that. But something that we've seen some more feedback on is the number of unique spells a spellcaster could cast on a given day has gone down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, was the goal in giving these casters less options? Sorry, what was the goal in giving uh, the casters less options? Oh, th- th- there's two things. I mean, there's the the answer that's pretty lame if you like playing casters as well to keep it simpler because I know people like if you're playing a caster, you feel like, well, I can't handle the complexity. But uh, it really speaks to just um, keeping the power balance between casters and non-casters. Uh, the more slots we give you... Um, well, there's actually there's a couple things that, 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 that are embedded in there. But the root of it is the more slots we give you, the more versatile you are as a caster the more different spells you can choose from, the more the more situations that you can choose to excel in. So one of the things with a spell is when you prepare it, whether it's a spell slot system or a spell point system or even the power system of 4th edition, if you, for instance, choose invisibility as a spell, you're kind of saying, in certain situations, I want to have this I win button. If we need to sneak past someone or I need to hide from someone, I can cast invisibility, I know it's going to work. That runs, and that I think really runs to the, runs to the heart of the conflict between spell casters and non-spell casters in the system. Um, if, for instance, for instance, I'm a rogue and I just have a really high uh, bonus to hide, I could still roll a natural one, or the person looking for me could roll a really high check to find me. The oh, and my thing fell out. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. These things are pretty lame. The uh, so you're kind of saying if I prefer a spell, I want to be able to win in this situation. So just by kind of and, and it's not that's not 100% across the board, right? But even in combat spells, like with with a fireball, you know, you can throw a fireball in, in the midst of a bunch of orcs, and you can blow them all off. You know, as opposed to a fighter having to hack his way through them one at a time. That's what feels cool about being a caster, is getting that right spell, getting to feel powerful. Right. But if we give you too many spells, and now you're winning every situation, that is where trouble starts to come in. If you can say, you know what, I have so many spell slots, I can just... I, I, I've, and I, I've played this. i played this character multiple times over the course of playing D&D. I can load up on utility spells. We can we can we can hide, you know, invisibility, fly, things like that. We can get past uh, obstacles. I can load up on spells like augury or comprehend languages, whatever, to you know, just for information gathering, so we can solve those charm spells. You know, I, I have played one character, like a, a tenth level sorcerer in third edition, just by picking a diverse set of spells, I could solve most situations. Mm-hmm. And by the time I was running low on spells, that was also the time when the adventure was going to end. Even if getting aside any instance of like I was, you know, alpha striking, pouring all my spells into a situation, even not even doing that, just knowing, look, I have like 20 spells I can cast during the course of the next, it's probably too high. It's probably more like 15 to 16. But that's still just enough. You just think of 15 or 16 things I get to do. That's a lot of scenes in an adventure. That's That's covering a lot of ground in one day of adventuring, whether it's fighting or exploring. So... I actually think it's pretty important for us to turn down the number of spells that casters can cast in one day uh, to really speak to keeping a nice balance between non-spell casters and spell casters. Now, with that all said, we don't want to punish spell people who like playing spell casters for choosing to do that. Right. So, don't punish me, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I play wizards too. I haven't played a cleric once in a while. But the um, so what we're looking at actually. I'm obviously this is why we're in play test mode. One of the things we really get to do. And one of the things that's been so great about getting such good feedback from people, uh, I know people argue and people get kind of frustrated sometimes, but it's actually, I mean, we expect that, right? Like when we put out a packet, I always know the first two days in the forums, people are going to be like upset. But then like by day three, people are sitting down and playing or they've talked through it or they've vented and now they've got it out of their system. Now we're getting a lot of really good feedback. What this lets us do, and I'm so happy we're in this position because to me this is like our best case scenario. We're in a position now where we can start experimenting. We can start intentionally trying to push things. Like the rogue. I mentioned the rogue. We kind of put a rogue out there knowing this rogue just flat out isn't as good as fighting as a fighter. 
do people who play rogues like that, or do they feel this is bogus? I should be on a fairly level playing field because I don't have as many hit points, because I only have light armor, because I've actually I don't have a lot of different things I can do with my expertise size to do damage. I'm going to be sneak attacking guys to take them out. So let me just do that, or give me a nice default thing where if I have to just shoot an arrow at an orc, I'm, I still feel effective. The um, so this is allowing us to be a little more experimental in what we're doing to kind of push those boundaries and see where. Where, where where the truth lies. We don't have to be as conservative as we might otherwise have to be. Yeah, and, and the spell slot change in, in the most recent, recent packet is, is probably the most prominent example of us basically pushing as close to the edge as we can get uh, to see how much is too much. Because uh, when we did it, uh, I mean, we did it with open eyes. I mean, yeah. we had all sorts of arguments Actually, about... Yes, I was going to say, if I remember when I first said, I think we'd like to do this, I believe you were the first person to tell me, we'll do this for a week, and then we'll go back to yep. the way it's... <laughs> yeah. And because I, I told Mike... <laughs> this isn't going to work. We're, we're going to get all the all the concern that we have seen online. Well, but even with internal testers, but yep. what was interesting is we got some pushback, but we also found a lot of people didn't really comment on it. We actually yeah. found some people saying, oh, I get it, this mm-hmm. is actually easier. Uh, they can see what the balance is. So it doesn't mean it's a slam dunk that it's you know 100% working, but we can get a sense of hey, this is worth experimenting. This right. is worth trying. Because we, we, we can always go back to the way it was. And and that as Mike, as you were saying, this is the wonderful position that we're in that we can actually test this stuff. Yeah. Um, if if we find it that this approach, you know, blows up like the Hindenburg, we're not going to keep going down this road. I mean, we'll we will course correct. Um, but it's worth us testing yep. because because if it turns out that those of us who adore playing wizards and clerics and druids and other spellcasters, if we still feel like we are a fully capable you know master of magic and can do that with fewer spell slots, which means in general we're going to have a more straightforward play experience. We're not going to have to make as many choices. But if the choices we're making pack a big punch and are still exciting and we're still able to express our character concepts, I consider that a big win. You know, if, we, if we're able to maintain that, that, that satisfying and fun experience and make the experience a little simpler, awesome. But if we find that it's too much, that we've gone too far, we'll correct. Yeah. And, and as Mike said, we argued a lot about this. He, Mike and I argued a yeah. lot about <laughs> this. Um, but, but again, the, the beauty of where we are is we can just test it and, and, and see what's working and what isn't. Yeah, and it also means as we go forward, we can try looking at solutions that are, aren't quite so like, oh, let's just give you, give you back more slots. We might, right. what, what I would actually personally like to be able to do is take the rules for rituals, make rituals free. And so, and, and counter it that way, because I think what that actually does is it lets you as a caster cast a lot of spells, but since, and let's just say for instance, I forget what the exact rule is now, but if a ritual takes five minutes or 10 minutes to cast, it means that in, in the heat of the moment, like if you, you know, you suddenly come across a, uh, you know, a gang of thieves, you know, in, in the, the rough part of town and need, need to talk your way out, the wizard who prepared charm person feels really smart because he can cast that and talk his way past it. But if the wizard doesn't have charm person in that situation, the rogue's still going to make a charisma check. You're still, or you're going to just role play your way out of it. But if you're doing something that's more strategic, like you're thinking, "Hey, we need to break into the thieves' guild. How can we get in?" Then a spellcaster has all these options available because you can, you know, with a five minute casting time, you can say, "Okay, well, I'm going to cast uh, invis- in, 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 uh, in invisibility as a ritual, or I'm going to, you know, cast a group buff to make us all invisible for a period of time." I don't have to. Pre- I don't, maybe I don't have to prepare that spell, but it's also, but it's it's fitting into the same thing where there's maybe the rogue who's going to put on a disguise or the bard who's going to go around town and gather rumors or the wizard who's going to go to the, the you know whatever the, the, the D&D equivalent of the, of the Department of Records and try to find the blueprints for the Thieves Guild or right. find the guy who the helped build it. scriptorium in the monastery. Yeah, you know, find the guy who helped build it so we can find the, tra- the, the, uh, the, uh, the plans for the place or find the secret passage. They're all kind of working on the same area. You know, it's on that more strategic level where I think we can afford to be a lot freer with spells, especially spells that are doing things like uh, more utilities, more that pr- pr- uh, promote more creative play where you think, hey, what I'll do is, you know, I'm going to cast a uh, rope trick right outside the Thieves Guild so we can hide in there you know, when the guards are changing or something like that, and then scurry down the rope over the wall when no one's looking. You know, it's right. you don't feel like you're being constrained into just what you prepared that day. You have more options. And obviously we have to look at how we want to balance that. It would probably change how we're approaching rituals. But I think that kind of puts the players, when they're in a strategic mode, in the same playing field, whether you're a caster or a more martial guy, and then also then in specific encounters, whether it's exploration, interaction, whatever, you're also, again, you're kind of in that same sphere. 
you know, we're allowing like options to compete with with similar options on in terms of how often you use them. Also, a, a an important thing to consider as people uh, play the current packet and see how this new spellcasting approach feels is that lowering of spell slot number, the number of spell slots is combined with signature spells and also at will spells. And in all of these things together sort of create our current spell casting tapestry. And so I, I encourage everyone who's play testing to see how all those options, in addition to rituals, feel together. And once they've considered all those options together, see, you know, is, is my spellcaster satisfying? Am I able to make the kinds of creative choices that Mike was just describing? Um, and do I still feel effective in combat without overshadowing everybody else in the party? Because uh, that's also the balancing act that we want. I mean, we want, we want the wizard and the cleric and other spellcasters to feel, you know, awesome and magical the way wizards and other spellcasters do in stories but not to the point where, you know, the fighter and the rogue and everybody else is their lackey. Exactly. Um, and, and again, that's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky path uh, for us to walk down. Um, but yeah, I just encourage everybody uh, test out all those options. Um, we also know that there are people who want nothing to do with at will magic or signature spells and want Vancey in all the way. We know there are also people who want nothing to do with Vancey and magic. So that's also a part of our challenge. Yeah. Is, oh, but is, that, that's easy to solve. Yeah. That's yeah. Actually, we, and that's, that, that's the, easy, the easiest problem because that's just different options for characters. Yeah. And then a DM just deciding which ones fit into a campaign. And, and I bring that up because people will even see in the current packet pathways for people who want sort of the Vancey and free approach uh, versus people who want just Vancey and magic. Because in the wizard, the academic tr tradition is coming very close to just being Vancey. Granted, it does still have at will magic. And we left that there because we have gotten overwhelming feedback that people in general like having some at will magical options. But uh, people will notice the, the academic tradition does not have a signature spell. Um, that it is it is focused on daily spell casting, uh, whereas we you know we have discussed uh, further tradition options for the wizard as well as other spell casting options that pull even further away from uh, daily spells. Uh, so there's still a lot of experimentation for us to do uh, in the months ahead. Um, yeah, those uh, alternate spell casting systems are something that people are really looking forward to. Do you guys have any more information you can share on how that's shaping up or when people can expect that kind of thing? Yeah, it's probably... Um, so right now we're still uh, messing with the core casting system. Right. So once we have that completely done... But one of the things to keep in mind is uh, sort of... Not that I don't want to say the breakthrough. It's not like we're geniuses to figure this out. But the uh, we you know we approach the, the casting system with these kind of terms that are that it can sort of migrate from, from system to system. So at will spell, ritual spell level, things like that. One of the things I, I really like us to be able to do is, and this may make people unhappy or sad, I guess it depends on, on how you feel about it, is create more unification in spell casting between, say, clerics and wizards. Kind of get them, see how close we can make them, but still make them feel a little bit different. And then once we have that nailed down, then it's really just a matter of just coming up with different ways to mess around with the math of spells. So you can have a spell point system, uh, you know, pure spell points, uh, you know, where just a spells level tells you how many points it costs to, to cast it. Um, the tricky one, like if you want to change how often you can cast spells, like encounter spells and stuff. Um, right now, you've got we've got you basically at one with with uh, signature spells. Um, I'm not sure how much flex we have there, but 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 once we have the system built, we know how powerful a wizard has to be. It's just, it's it's algebra, right? It's just saying you know right. a fifth level wizard equals three x plus two y plus z. Then we just we just change what x, y, and z equal, or we just have three x plus two y plus z equals you know, a cubed, and then we're we're all set. You know, and we just we're just a matter of balancing those two sides. So uh, we know the kind of um, magic systems we want to do. I mean, they shouldn't surprise anyone. I know a spell point system is something people like. Uh, something that's more recharge based, so you're not just you know you cast a spell and it's just gone. I want to be like my spells back. So then, really, it's just a matter of saying, okay, if you get let's imagine you live in a world where you get all your spells back every five minutes. How many spells can we let you cast in that time period? Uh, in a spell where we just give you spell points. Well, how many times do we want you to be able to cast your most powerful spell? How many times do you want you to be able to cast your weakest spell? 
and how does that in intersect with at will spells and rituals? And, and those are all pretty straightforward, right? You can imagine in a spell point system of rituals, just it doesn't cost any spell points, take five minutes. And at will spell just costs zero spell points, things like that. So it, it, again, it's 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 interesting when you think about D and D and a lot of the, the challenges we face. It's a lot of these things are just solved problems. It's just a matter of how do we apply it to D and D. And and what people are noticing right now uh, with different parts of the system, and specifically with magic is a pattern that occurs in a large design project, uh, and that is a fluctuation between diversification and then unification. So in the Gen, Gen Con packet, there was an emphasis on diversification when it came to magic. We experimented with wildly different approaches to magic. You know, the wizard, the cleric, and then the warlock and the sorcerer, very different in many of the particulars. Um, but people will see in the most recent packet now we're starting to unify. Uh, and we're going even further with some of those efforts in the packet that we're working on right now. Uh, but that means later on we will experiment with more diversification. Um, so in, in, in every part of the system where we do this, we'll, we'll basically sort of wander off into the wilderness, you know, see how far can we go in, you know, in the paladin? How far can we go in the ranger? And then we see all right, what have we learned here that now we can take back to the core system? Yeah. Uh, and, and so specifically, we're doing that right now with magic. We're, we're wandering down these different paths, seeing what we behind, find behind you know, different trees, and say, ha, here's something that not only benefits this class, it's going to benefit the whole game. We take it back to the core game. Often that will cause changes to ripple through the whole system. Then we go back to the class and see, all right, class, now what are we going to do with you? Um, and so there's, there's this ebb and flow, and people are going to keep seeing it uh, from packet to packet. Yeah, and there might even be some things where we could kind of make some hopefully interesting leaps for it. Yeah. Uh, you could imagine that, uh, you know, with expertise dice, the way they're shipping up, uh, there could be a caster who, use, who uses those. Mm -hmm. You could easily imagine a warrior mage style class, you know, the class of Gish. We kind of experimented that with a sorcerer. Um, and it might be well. We want to. We like that concept. We want to give it a different name because people people want to convert their third and fourth edition sorcerers without becoming warrior mages. Um, but that might be something where we could say, okay, this guy is actually using a kind of different spell casting system because he's using expertise dice with his magic because he's yeah. again this kind of warrior mage gish class. Well, it's we, very different. And yeah. we even have an internal version of the cleric. And here I'll spill some beans. Uh, an internal version of the cleric that has both spells and expertise yeah. dice. But they don't cross over right now. Right. And that's right. really just say, hey, if the cleric is supposed to be good in melee, then we should probably, if, if expertise becomes, hey, I'm really good at melee, we're expressing it with the system, then we'll just, we'll give the cleric some, some part of that. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you both mentioned the Sorcerer and the Warlock, um, and that was something that was absent from this last playtest packet because you guys were working on them. Uh, can you talk at all about the changes you're making to either of those two classes? Yeah, I think the big thing for those two classes is uh, we tried seeing what would happen if we had different spell casting systems expressed through class. Um, and people seem kind of lukewarm about that. Um, so the concepts will remain. I think what you'll see with a sorcerer is we'll just we will give it a new name and make it its a, give its own full identity and have a sorcerer class, which is a lot more like the third and fourth edition sorcerer. Um, but we also see people do like the idea of playing a warrior mage. But we also know if we can do a warrior mage to type guy, we don't want him to just be some rehash of a, a fighter wizard multi class. So. That's where something kind of interesting could come up of a different, a really different mechanic would make a lot of sense. Yeah, it's 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 funny because even though the sorcerer and the warlock, at least when it comes to the public packet, are on ice, um, we we keep coming back to the sorcerer in particular uh, because even though a lot many pieces of that class won't necessarily end up in the actual sorcerer. Um, we, we revisit what the work we've done on that class every time we talk about classes from other editions, uh, you know, like the Blade Singer, uh, the Sword Mage, uh, you know, the many classes that have appeared over the course of the game's history that are basically variations on the Fighter Mage uh, theme. And I think with the Warlock, the... Um... It's just, it's just getting the balance right. Uh, I think we're actually in a pr pretty good place with the Warlock, but it's just um, we want to basically figure out where we are. For high-level play, it just makes more sense for us to, to go ahead with the Cleric and the Wizard and then and then go back and, and take care of the war, the Warlock and expand expand that outward. Uh, we also know one thing with the Warlock, we got a lot of feedback and just the power level, so it, it just needs a little more polish to make sure that the kind of right. the way it's using magic doesn't feel like, you know, for instance, uh, Eldritch Blast damage was really was way too high, and since it's something you're doing all the time, 
it kind of feels like, well, you know, that's going to obviously color people's perceptions. And also just questions like, do we need to give you that, that, that ability as a default? Like, I don't think so. I think we can be, be more flexible in how we present the Warlock. Um, but the flavor overall uh, went over pretty well. And um, I think it's, unlike the Sorcerer, I think if he played a Warlock in prior editions, he felt this was, this was pretty close to what I had in the past. It's not, it's not the same. And obviously we'll make, make sure it, you feel like you can comfortably convert your characters. Um, but I think that one's closer to the Sorcerer, especially just on the concept of it. Yeah. And, and any time uh, in, in the ebb and flow of our work, we are in a period where we're focusing on, again, sort of unifying things, core system. Our focus always comes back to the classic four classes uh, because in many ways, all other classes need to work in reference to those four. Uh, because everybody knows who's been playing D and D, you know, whether it's for a year or for nearly forty years, uh, the the game is primarily defined on the player side by those four classes, and so those four classes have to be, you know, just absolutely solid. Um, and then so much of the design for other classes is in reference to those classes, even when those classes, the you know, classes like the Druid and the Paladin and the Ranger, et cetera, et cetera, even when they wander down their own paths and have very unique game mechanics, they're still always in many ways in reference back to those core four. Speaking of the core four, uh, that was going to be the focus for a while, but earlier on we mentioned that the original goal was to have pretty much everything from that was in a PHB one style book uh, in in the D&D next kind of core class choice. Um, is that still or, the case? Or, or are the plans in some form? Sorry, what was that, Jeremy? Oh, I said or or at least appear in some form. Yeah, yeah. I think, sorry, that's that's a question too. Did they show up in like uh, specialties or backgrounds or some type of subclass in a class? Uh, is that still kind of the case, or have plans changed? No, I think actually the. Um... Uh, let's see. The, the going through the player's handbook one because if we go to two, then we'd start adding a lot of classes. Right. Like, you know, the, right. The uh, it might just become too much. But the um, so I believe that at this stage, the only class that has appeared uh, in a player's handbook one that I have some question about is just the assassin, because it did show up in AD and D and then got dropped in second edition. And it's not clear, like, well, can an assassin, like, how close is it to the rogue? I mean, the assassin in AD&D had a lot of abilities that I think would just make a lot more sense now as uh, options for the rogue. Like, uh, in AD&D, the assassin could uh, use poison. Uh, he could disguise himself. And so in AD&D, where, like, the, uh, there really wasn't, like, a skill system, is more just your class just told you exactly what you could do. Um, that made some sense. So it's not clear to me, like, would we be doing a service to the game by having the Assassin class, or would it just maybe make, be making things confusing? In 4th edition, we gave the Assassin a lot of shadow magic, but it's not clear to me, like, does that make sense for us to canonically say that, hey, people who are called Assassins in the world of D&D use shadow magic? Right. Or should it be something a little more uh, mundane? So that's the one I have a lot of questions about. The other one, uh, and the other class I have, not questions about whether we'll do it, more how we'll do it. So mm -hmm. when we think of the Warlord, the uh, the warlord being making it well it was there was the marshal in third edition and then there's the warlord in fourth edition so it's just a question of what's the real flavor and where does this class fit in in the world of D and D the um, because when you look back what, what I want to make sure is every class has like a real clear sense of who that guy is in terms of uh, the world and so I think we just well the one thing I'd like to do with the warlord is make sure. It just—it's clear, like, hey, if you meet a first level warlord, what does that mean? And like, even just like the class name is like, does warlord make sense for like a right. guy who is just a beginning person? I, as a I just—I wizard? I just fell off the turnip truck, and I am a warlord. <laughs> yeah, it's—it's it's a little like, it, but that's a lot of that's just more flavor stuff, and right. we think of who those characters are. I think what kind of hurts us too is in terms of uh, any adventures for fourth. We didn't really have a good warlord, warlord NPC who showed up. So it's not really clear, like, who, who are these guys? Are they getting special training? So I think one of the things with the Warlord especially is just to make sure we have a good framework for, for the, the world flavor and who they are. Uh, unlike a monk, say, who monks are, like, it's kind of weird to have this Western fantasy game and you have these martial artists. But, yep, okay, they're, they're from monasteries. You can see, and they kind of have these divine ties. But you go back and look at, you know, D&D source books. They tie them to the clerical orders a lot. Um, so you have a good sense of who they are in the world. Um, and there's also, of course, the big question is just if warlords in 4th edition could heal without magic. What does it mean to heal someone without using magic in D&D? You know, what, hit points are kind of this abstract representation of a mix of, you know, luck and energy and, you know, physical vigor and also taking it wounds and injuries. Uh, we've tried to kind of make that clear, like, you know, when you're above half your hit points, you haven't really been injured yet. You're just more tired. You, any injuries you have are very incidental. 
Um, it's, it's only when you're below half your hit points that you're actually maybe taking actual physical damage. Um, but even that, it's like, well, if you're, 100, if you're 50, a 20th level fighter, what does that mean? Like, you're just, you know. So there's still, there's a lot of abstraction hit points, but we want to make sure that if you're using non-magical healing, it feels right. It doesn't right. break the narrative. It's also, I don't want to just duplicate a cure light wounds and give it to a guy who's not using magic. I mean, that's the easy way out. But I think that se selling short what could be something that's a little more interesting and a little more vivid and something that fits in better with the world. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's a theme that we've come back to often. Like when we've talked at PAX and Gen Con about our thinking on classes, we're always starting with world first. Yeah. Um, like for us, and, and we could say this about every single class in the game, but I'll focus on the warlord. Uh, Cause that, that's, that's the one uh, that's on our minds right now. Uh, it isn't enough for us to, and I'll use the fourth edition terms here, it's not enough for us to say, oh, sure, the class is a martial leader. Like, we need more than that. We need a story. We need to, as Mike said, we need to know where are these people in the world? Where are they trained? Who have these people been in classic D&D fiction? You know, can we go back to the first edition sources and point at somebody and say, they are a member of this or that class? Yeah. Um, and, and, so with all of that in mind, we come back to the Warlord often. Um, and as I said earlier, when we started this segment, uh, we're committed to every Player's Handbook 1 class having a place in the game. The question is, will that place literally be a class? Or, or yeah, we hope so. I'm uh, with yeah. There will be a class that fills that role. Yeah. It just, whether it's called the Warlord or... Because you know, actually what I found interesting is when you start breaking up the classes... There's an interesting fight between the bard and the warlord. Right. Because yep. bards, so we, if you guys, bear with me for a sec. You kind of think like, <laughs> hey, who are these guys in the story? Because, you know, one of the challenges we face when you think of the warlord, hey, the tactically really smart guy, that guy's usually leading an army, right? He's not leading four guys. He's leading 400 guys, right? right. He's doing really, he's, you know. He's truly a warlord. Exactly. And then if you try to think of like guys from like, say, but just fiction or myth or even like movies, and like was Leonidas in 300, was he a warlord? right because he's this inspiring guy but when you watch the movie and you kind of think well what's his role well he's just this really badass fighter who leads by just being a badass fighter like right. you know it's like you know the, this he's a leader because he's really good at what he does but he's not necessarily like this like tactical genius who's yelling at the other spartans to do stuff the um you know for me and 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 so then you think well who they, what is it about a warlord that makes him inspiring and you kind of well it's probably very charismatic you know, there's probably more personal magnetism when you're talking about a fight between four guys on a side than it is like I'm the strategic genius. Like I'm really good at I'm really good at you know, supply lines and you know making sure the archers have enough arrows and stuff. And you know it it, it kind of brings some things. Well, is that kind of like a fighting bard almost? And then you can kind of start seeing some interesting implications of like, well, does that mean like in, in fourth edition the bard was a leader and third edition the bard could cast spells like cure light wounds? But that wasn't true in second edition. In first edition, the, the, the bard did get druid spells, so I think Cure Light Wounds was there as a second level spell. Mm -hmm. But in third, the bard just got wizard spells. So do you maybe think the bard is a little more illusions, a little more trickery, um, stuff that's like, a bard doesn't heal your wounds, like he, but he might like trick someone or outsmart them. Mm, Does but, that kind of shift things around? The, um, but the bard should actually heal your wounds. Why? Because bards in Celtic mythology heal your wounds. Yeah, but this isn't a role-playing game of Celtic mythology. It's a role-playing <laughs> game of the dragons, right? But that's the thing. Is, right? If you go back right. to, in second edition, bards didn't heal wounds, right? And was that like a good version of the bard or a bad version of the bard? Like, and even if you say, okay, bards can heal wounds, was that because bards are healers or because, well, bards know a little bit of everything and they're kind of these jack-of-all-trade guys? And so you just have an interesting thing you can entangle and it might let you say, okay, we can take the warlord and make him a little more interesting because we're going to shift the bar a little bit to be more maybe of a trickster guy. I mean, if you look at a lot of, uh, like, the d, d novels especially, the bards there aren't necessarily healers. They're kind of more trickster guys, the kind of vagabonds and stuff like that. Does that is that what, what resonates with people? And that's what's really, to me, the interesting question is, and again, it's what's great about the playtest. We can kind of see what resonates. Do people look at this and go, hey, this is exactly what, this is, really feels like the way it should be. The... Um, rather than trying to start all over and just kind of ask, like, what is this thing? You know, we can be a little more, like, we know kind of what it is, but do we want to shade it this way? Like right. the rogue versus the fighter question. Are people like, you know what, rogues just shouldn't be as good at, at all that useful to fight because they're the rogues. They're the skill guys. They're the trap guys. And people saying, no, it's actually, I mean, if it's a fight, everyone should be able to do something fun and interesting and take part. Right. So. And, and also, thankfully, our classes are all very... Um, they're very textured when it comes to their options. And so there will, there will tend to be a certain amount of overlap. 
Uh, so the bard, in the end, will probably have some modest healing options, uh, but it shouldn't be the focus. Uh, because even going back to my Celtic, Celtic mythology example, most of the time, especially in Irish myth, the bards are messing with people's minds. It's sort of a once in a while they might sing a song that soothes a person's wounds, but mostly the bards are there. Uh, and I think it's it, there's this great battle in Irish mythology where it said they put satires on their enemies, which caused them to lose their courage. So, you know, in D&D in &D terms, they're, they're casting illusions and enchantments. Yeah, it's a savage burn. They ran up. <laughs> That's right. The, uh, but yeah, so it's, it's all just a matter of making sure the class feels right and uh, yeah. and that you know we we have a really vivid, clear identity for it. That people go, hey, that 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 makes sense. It fits. It feels great. I really, I want to be that guy. You right. Know, so. So you guys have uh, talked about healing and hit points a little bit. So let's switch gears that direction. Um, the only class to have any changes to hit points in the last packet was the wizard, kind of bumping it up a hit die and making it a little bit more durable. Um, does this mean you feel like the basic hit points and hit dice numbers are pretty stable for all the classes? Or do you think um, we're going to see some changes? Yeah, well, well, I mean, it all just depends. Once we get the monster math right, then then, then, then we'll know for right. sure exactly. Because we know right now the monsters aren't, they're not hitting often enough. Um, and they feel a little weak. So, so that's really, I mean, we and, had some general unhappiness about hit points, but the wizard had a lot of feedback saying that the D4 hit die just felt really right. punishing. So. And, and frankly, we've even discussed bumping the rogue up. Uh, so that the rogue yeah, and the cleric and, uh, uh, have the same starting and, hit points, and I think we will. Base it, it's kind of it's kind of thing where you can see while well, people are saying, "Hey, the, the the rogue should be like a pretty competent in the fight," then we should probably bump the rogue's hit points up a little bit. So you have you know if you have a classic four adventurers, the rogue can have a sword and be up in the front line, not like a fighter defending, but he can be he can be up there if he has to be. Yeah. So Good it's, it's not his hit points holding him back; it's his armor class. Yeah. We also saw some uh, interesting new optional rules from you guys for healing up between on short and long rests. Um, I haven't seen the survey feedback. I don't know if you guys have, but Not assuming yet. people people like that option, is that the kind of thing you expect to to give modules and stuff for? Yeah, I think healing is. I mean, healing is the one lever that really changes the the tenor of your campaign by a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, like as an example, I actually like the option where you can just you can always heal up to half, because to me that makes it just easier as a DM. I, I know that the players, I mean, I think at half hit points you still feel threatened, but you don't feel like you're always just going to go on. But it does give you a buffer if you, you know, you're, you're not ending the adventure just because you're out of Cure Light Wound spells or you're ending the adventure because, or you're heading back home because you've had enough or you got into a tough fight or, you know, something went wrong. The, um, so I, I actually like that, but it, this is the one thing I think where D, we've seen the most divergence of people because it depends on what you think of fantasy is. Do you think of right. fantasy as being uh, a Game of Thrones where it's a pretty rough world and, you know, one, one unlucky hit can kill you? Or do you see it being a little bit more like, say, uh, Conan the Barbarian, where everyone knows, you know, Conan's not just going to get randomly skewered by a sword. He's a really tough guy. He can, you know, he's, he's skilled, he's talented. Or, you know, the named heroes are, are, are really difficult to bring down. Or like Lord of the Rings, you know, where Boromir just wades through, a, you know, three dozen orcs. You know, that's how many orcs it takes to, to wear him down. He, yeah, him. he has to s sprout an entire bush worth of arrows before he falls. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think that's just one thing when people look at the stuff that inspires their D&D campaigns and what they, they turn to is, like, hey, this is what I think of as fantasy or the kind of game I want to run. I think it's the, the one, the thing that'll just by default have options baked in. So. Yeah. And... And people are seeing the different options, not only because it is a play test, but as Mike just suggested, um, because we expect those options to be in the final version of the game. Uh, because we, we have committed in certain parts of the game to providing an array of options that let people model the fantasy they like. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, in the game in the past, we've experimented with sort of picking a one-size-fits-all for everything. That does work for certain parts of the game. Um, like, we don't need to offer different mechanics for how you make an attack roll. Yeah. Um, but but there, are, there are other mechanics, and I think uh, healing is an example of them, where just tweaking it a bit can completely change the feel of the story that you're telling. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you guys already mentioned the monster math needing some work. Can we expect some sweeping changes in the next packet or a packet in the future? Or is this something that's going to take some more time to figure out? Um, I think we're actually pretty close to having some changes in the math made. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in general, monster accuracy is going to go up a little bit. Um, I don't know if armor classes and, and damage or... Well, damage might change. So one of the things we're talking actually, about... Is, actually, almost everything right now could change. Yeah. And so, in fact, while we're talking, um, a segment of the department is engaged in a series of stress tests yeah. uh, 
uh, testing out all of the new math. They're, they've actually been doing that all week. I like to think is that they're, they're driving trucks across the bridge and they see how heavy of a truck makes the bridge collapse. <laughs> yep. The uh, which is it's not normally how we play test, but it's just it's one way to make sure the math's working. Yeah. But some of the stuff we're looking at doing is saying like, what if we didn't apply ability score mods to, to damage rolls? Because you know I have an 18 strength that feels really important at first level when I'm rolling 1d8 plus four, but by the time I'm like 10th level, and I might be rolling like 1d8 plus 3d10 plus five, like is the five what's it really doing there? It also gets in the way of things like if you want to let you do two up in fighting, like right now the big drawback to two up in fighting, why you've seen a couple different versions of it, which believe me we've gotten the feedback on people don't like it, <laughs> is hey, if I'm getting my ability mod and I attack twice, well I'm attacking. It's not just I'm going from you know I'm doubling my damage. Um, obviously, if you're just doing, you know, if you're doing a, a, an attack with a longsword twice, you're, you're doubling it. But if we can do things like we have to use a light weapon, so we can reduce the, the the die size. If there's an attack penalty, it doesn't have to be a huge attack penalty. It might only mean to be minus one or minus two to make a one d8 attack equivalent to a one d8 and a one d6 or one d4 attack, or a one d6 and a one d4 is equivalent to one d8 because there's just a couple things we can do with accuracy and things like that. So th I think actually that's the kind of change where it at first level might seem like a big change, but um, for the entirety of the system, it actually makes things work better and then enables a lot of other options that we may otherwise just have to implement, frankly, kind of bogus ways. So that kind of small change can have a lot of ripples. That's the kind of stuff we're looking at now too. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the thing too. We're looking at, uh, you know, in the current packet, we're using um, average damage from monsters um, you know, that's an option we're putting in there. What are things we can do with the math to speed things up? Mm -hmm. If we're getting rid of a lot of these small modifiers, because that's one thing we've seen with advantage and disadvantage. People like, people generally like something at 80, something percent of people like the idea of getting rid of a lot of these plus ones and plus twos. Going back to this idea of being experimental, we can afford to try these thing, new things out. Right. What if we go even further with it? What if we start taking off even more of these modifiers? Where, where does that end up? Are people like, yeah, this is actually... Sure, it's tradition that you used to get your strength mod to damage, though in AD&D, &D, this is always the thing we have the argument of, well, in AD&D, &D, that wasn't the case, because, you know, if you look at the orc entry, or even the ogre entry in the monster manual, they weren't getting their strength mod to damage, they're just rolling like a d10, or whatever it was. The, um, so, which one is the actual right path? I don't think we have a definitive answer either way, and that's why it's great about the playtest, we can show off things and, and see where they end up. The, um, so it's giving us the the freedom to experiment in a lot of ways that we otherwise wouldn't have. Well, we could have, but we would have been less sure of ourselves. It looks like we're running low on time at this point. Do you guys have anything else you want to share about the upcoming DB Next playtest packets or the process in general? Uh, I think overall, it's just it's been great. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, we really we started this this playtest, and this is something that was really important to me to make sure we were doing it right that we weren't just doing the playtest as lip service to people, that we were really engaging in a conversation with, with everyone playing D&D. &D. Uh, you know, I kind of had this funny little talk with the designers a couple months ago now saying, you know, we're working on a game that everyone knows what it is. It's Dungeons and Dragons. We're not trying to invent a new game. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're just trying to make a game that people can say, this feels like D&D &D, and it matches what I expect and it's letting me play D&D &D. it's, it's in a way that's more enjoyable than it's ever been. So in a lot of ways, it's really just a big refinement process. And I think in order for us to really have a useful refinement process, we have to understand D&D players and DMs and make sure what we're doing makes sense to, 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 to people who play the game. Um, so it's been really great. It's been really, uh, it's been kind of actually, in some ways, it, the, the game design is the easiest part of it because we do have this great process. So many people are taking part. I mean, it's by far, it's been overwhelming the number of people who, who downloaded the packet and been giving us feedback. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just been really great. The um, I don't know if I want to drop any spoilers. So, so next week, uh, don't drop, uh, don't drop any spoilers. What? So I can have another drop. I'm just gonna say no spoiler. Uh, so next week, there's my Legends lore goes up. It's like if you try to grab it early, it's like it's like 9 p.m. Western time. But it is not going to be my only Legends of Lore that I'm posting next week. So this is gonna be a second uh, LNL. Good job. With oh, good job. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Good job. <laughs> You want to pat me on the head while you're at it? You got a dog biscuit over there? <laughs> when, we're, when we're off the air. Good job. Good, good. I'll give myself a good job. Good to go. Good, good, good. good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah, so anyways, uh, keep your eyes peeled because we have a little surprise for you guys next week on the website. Yeah. Cool. And, and you know, we, we could keep talking for another hour about all the things. No, we couldn't. It's lunchtime. It's 1230. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, because like we we didn't get to touch on skills yet, because uh, I know that uh, there's a lot of feedback about people how, are, how, feedback. Gran how granular the, the the skill list is now. So I'd love to talk about that. But Th that, that that is a very clinical way of saying people hate use rope. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but, and then again, I would love to have time to talk about it and why it's there. You can say it. You're, you're, instead of spending this thirty seconds explaining why you're not going to talk about it, just talk about it. Give them a quick answer. Oh. Quick answer about skills. Okay, great. Do um, it. I will talk about it. We're in charge. Um, so this this touches on one of the many aspects of this playtest where we were seeing, again, as we say, how far can we go? The latest packet, as everyone saw, has a very granular skill list that includes the return of uh, the skill everyone loves to hate, use rope. Yeah, apparently it killed someone's dog. Yes. Or, yeah, it's a lot of TPK. It is amazing, it's amazing the ire for or use, use rope. rope. It's just this little skill. It just wants to exist, and everyone hates it. Yeah. So what, what we, are, we are definitely monitoring that feedback. Uh, but it is fascinating to us, and, and one of the things we've been monitoring beyond feedback about particular skills like use rope or or spot or sneak is simply how people think about skills. Yes, yeah, exactly. Be because what's fascinating to us is that people are reacting to use rope as if we had the third or fourth edition skill system. And I say that because in third and fourth edition, most tasks in the game that are not attack rolls or saving throws, or spell casting and whatnot, uh, are routed through the skill system. In, again, in third and fourth, you know, you're in third and fourth. Most of the time, uh, you're making in fourth perception checks, or in third search checks, or spot checks, or listen checks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's fairly rare that you're actually using your ability scores directly. It's it's rare in third and fourth to be making a strength check or an intelligence check. I mean, it happens in most sessions, but most of the time, the checks being made are skill checks. And so a skill in third and fourth is actually a very different thing from what it is in D&D Next. Because in D&D Next, all task resolution is through your ability scores. You make intelligence checks, you make wisdom checks, you make charisma checks. What we're currently calling a skill is really just an area of very focused expertise where you get to and apply a bonus when you make an ability check having to do with that area. So one of the things we've been discussing is maybe we shouldn't even call these skills because we keep we keep seeing cognitive dissonance from from people because we call them skills but in the third and fourth edition sense they're not actually skills. It's just this is a very focused area where I get a bonus. Um, and so I I bring this up because we we take certainly a short view in the playtest often where we see, we see feedback on something and we adjust quickly. You know, you'll see a change in the very next packet. But we also have a very long view. And so there are things that people are giving feedback about now, like the skill system. It might be quite a while before they see their feedback bear fruit, but when it bears fruit, it might bear very big fruit. <laughs> Pumpkin. I think, I think Pumpkin because, because I haven't had lunch, I'm not going to start making a bunch of food, food metaphors. It's like a cheeseburger. Yes. Well, it'd be a vegetarian. Jeremy's vegetarian. It's like a veg and it's got all these onions, and it's so delicious. The onions is so good. That's right. The uh, yeah, a lot of it's just when you when you're when, you, when one of the big transitions when you're playing, especially from third to fourth to, to next, would be. The DM really should never be calling for a skill check. He's just always calling for a right. ability check. Right. But that's kind of thing where a presentation. I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. it's kind of an honest because we wrote it as if it's like, right. you know, if you look at it, oh, it's a skill yeah. system. So because that's, because we presentation is going to be really an interesting thing to start yeah. tackling soon. Because we're we're experiencing some of the same cognitive dissonance cognitive because incidents. because we we are also you know big third and fourth edition players. Um, and yeah, but it's fascinating to us when we see people referring to skill checks because technically in D and D next there are no skill exactly. checks. Exactly, but that, that's kind of thing where that, that's like a bigger picture thing. We'll start, yeah. start working on. So. Yeah, but yeah, bottom so line. You're able to explain to people, are we? Yeah, time? awesome. I took I took some extra minutes. <laughs> oh, we please. started a little late. It's it's your guys' lunch. I don't care. Well, we were five minutes late, so actually now we're like we are at an hour. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. We're, um, we're there. So, oh, and our batteries are dying. Yeah, and our our, our, our laptop batteries are about to die. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I will just close by saying thank you to everybody uh, who tuned in. Uh, thank you so much for all of the playtesting you're doing. Keep your feedback coming. Yes. Uh, it the the feedback is invaluable. Uh, this is this is turned into an amazing process. 
and all of us together are creating uh, what is turning into a fabulous edition of uh, the game we all love. Yeah. And thanks to Trevor for hosting. Yeah, thank you, Trevor. Thanks a lot. Oh, no problem, no problem. Thank you guys for uh, taking the time to answer questions today. Um, and as Mike and Jeremy have already said, thanks to everyone out there for joining us today and for all your continued involvement in the DNX playtest. This wouldn't be possible without all the feedback you've provided through surveys, forums, article comments, and then every place else out there like Twitter and Facebook. So thank you very much. And we'll see you next time. Cool. Take it easy, everybody. Bye, everyone.